It's Saturday, which means that Brody and Marley are at school with me today. So let's start with just something silly and fun like this. Good work, everybody. Good work. High five! All right, this is a quick-ish video because it is Saturday and I am up here with my kids and I'm actually still on spring break when I'm filming this anyway. But leading up to spring break, I had a couple of different ideas and things I was thinking about that I just thought would be beneficial to you all. And one of those was about differentiating instruction. This gets a lot of I don't know, attention, this topic, right? When I speak at colleges, someone's always asking me how I differentiate my instruction. And I think first is sort of identifying what that looks like in my classroom. Differentiating instruction is as simple as different students learn different ways and how are you gonna to teach to those different students? Because if you don't, if you have the class where you take the notes, where you study the notes, where you read on your own, where you take the test, some kids are gonna do well with that. Some kids, that's all they wanna do. They just wanna know, hey, do we get any points for this? How much credit is this worth? But what about the kids that learn in a different way? What about the kids that learn through talking about things or through activities or through building stuff or drawing things or creating pictures and PowerPoints or videos or whatever, something else that's not just sit quietly in a desk, work on this and hand it in at the end of the class. It's for those students that we differentiate instruction so we can play to their strengths, but it also levels the playing field and has those students that just do well reading and taking notes and regurgitating what we need them to on a test. It makes them live a little bit of a struggle also so that they have to tap into those sides of themselves that they don't typically tap into. And so one of the ways that we saw that this week was Myself and Mr. Fines in our, in our co-talk class, we were thinking about having the students take large pieces of paper and draw maps on them so they could label different parts of the island in Lord of the Flies because our students have a real difficulty in the two classes that we teach together with spatial awareness. So reading something and having a sense of like, where is the guy in the parachute? Where is the fire on the island? Where is the pig's head taking place? Where is Castle Rock? These things don't always connect in students' minds. So we thought drawing a map would be one cool way to do it. But what we decided to do instead, because Fines for some reason has Legos in his basement that he's had since 1986. Legos that, by the way, if you're watching this, Sarah, his fiance has made fun of him for having in his house. Came in totally handy. Hooray for hoarders. So this is what we did with the Legos. <laughs> We tell the students that they're going to make a model of either the island or of a particular scene from the book. And you're gonna do that using Legos. We spread their Legos all over the class. Fines has these two large like cases that he bought at Home Depot or something and a small duffel bag that looks like he's about to run away from home, fills them with Legos, brings them into the class. And so all the instructions that we give them are that be prepared to label and discuss what you have created. And so we learned a couple of things in this. One is students should have either worked by themselves or only in groups of two. That third person never does anything. And this is something I already knew and I don't know why I didn't think of it when we started. And actually, maybe it was a rule, but then you know you have that kid that co shows up and doesn't have a group and he's like, hey, can I just be a part of their group? And you say, yeah, and then it ends up they're the fourth dude. So now two people aren't doing anything. We also didn't realize that not everyone grew up with Legos. I just assumed the whole world had Legos. There's Lego movies, there's Lego video games, there's Legos in every store from the dollar store to the supermarket to, well, they used to be in Toys R Us too, but RIP Toys R Us. So some of this took some teaching on how to like build with the Legos, how to make a tree per se that was actually gonna stand on its own. But with a couple of kids, it really took hold. Kids really liked what they were doing. We had guys that actually came up from lunch or that came early or stayed late after school to play with Legos to build their model out even more. And then some dudes, like my guy Grant, missed most of the days and only had one day to actually build it. But he did a really good job. So I asked him to show his model. So here's Grant explaining as best he can the model that he made of his island from Lord of the Flies. Did you see my name? Yeah. All right, my name is Jimmy Grant. And uh, this is my Lego project. So to begin with, what I did was I started off with a gray board and then I worked my way up to make the water. I didn't have that many water pieces, so I used these to make waves. I started off with some yellow pieces to make uh, the beach. Ran out of yellow, then I used the gray pieces to make rock. I used more gray to build up to make a mountain, right? And then I used red pieces on top of that to make fire, since I didn't have that many fire pieces left. Over here is a tree 
didn't have any brown, so it's a burnt tree, so that's why it's black. The people here, they're trying to put out the fire. This is from the Lord of the Flies, the one they cut off. Um, that's just about it. Did you like doing this project? Well, yes, I did. Why? No, it's been a long since I played with Legos. I like to build random things with them, though. All right, good. Grant's a really great dude. If you're watching this, know that I appreciate you in class and I really appreciate the work that you put into that project, even though you only had one day. It really, if nothing else, showed the other guys it took four days to make something not so good as yours with all the scrap Legos. You didn't even get all the good stuff that everybody else had in the beginning. The other thing we learned from this is that you're gonna find Legos all over your classroom, so give the kids ample amount of time to clean up the Legos afterwards or make some sort of incentive system for cleaning up Legos because otherwise it's a parent's worst nightmare. And parents, you know what I'm talking about, the PTSD you get after walking on either a Hot Wheels car or a Lego in the middle of the night. It just sticks with you for the rest of your life. When the kids were done, we were going to have them present and show what they did in front of the class and talk about it, but we just didn't have enough time. Spring break kind of snuck up on us and it was that last week before spring break, which is why this really worked. Now we only did this with two of our periods because those were the periods we felt we needed the most. My college prep classes, they did something completely different. Those classes used online content from Scholastic Magazine. But I'm gonna take these guys home now, so I'll show you at home what I did with that. Look, one quick note on differentiation before I, before I transition here. If you differentiate, it does not mean that it has to take a lot of work on your part. What you're just doing is trying to figure out who your students are. And this might take some time during the year, and you might not get a sense of it right away. But what kids really like to draw or to create or to use clay in class, use Play-Doh in class, which is a lot cleaner than clay because clay gets all over the place, everyone leaves with brown hands, it's disgusting, gets all over their uniforms and stuff. Play-Doh is the way to go. And you can get Play-Doh cheap at the dollar store and then just chuck it when you're done. What kids like acting? What kids like creating films? It's, it is in that melting pot that everyone gets their chance to shine, that this child who sits quietly in the back of class that no one ever talks to that you didn't realize was really good at creating children's books or short stories or rhymes or poetry. It gives them a chance to shine also so that the class isn't that typical group of kids where the extroverts that do well at X, Y, and Z get to take over the class, get to shine all the time. You're letting the light shine on all of those sort of dark places in the classroom, the kids that are overlooked often, and that just creates a great space in your classroom where everyone feels welcomed, where everyone feels celebrated, where everyone feels like you're trying to teach to who they are also. Okay, now we're back home. I just wanna to say to my kids real quick, if you watch this, you were really good today. I really appreciate your help up there. It's hard, like I'm in my room and I'm recording, I made two videos, the kids have to sit quietly while I'm doing it, and they, they make the move because they're often in the background and they're doing, you know, I appreciate you guys. So I wanted to shoot this part at home on purpose, not just because my kids wanted to leave, but because this is something you can do from home. So I've been partnering with Scholastic Magazine and so part of that partnership is I get magazines every month and I get access to their online content. And to be honest, I didn't even know Scholastic like had high school level material. Like I've said that in the video before, but I thought, I always, rem when I think of Scholastic, I think of, my kids doing like their book drives at school where we go in and buy books, that's pretty much the end. Or maybe like like scholastic readers that I used to get in school. But before we went on spring break, we did like some mini lessons in class because we only had about four days of actual class. We were trying to finish some other stuff up and you know, you don't want to introduce something new or get into a new part of a book all the time. And I didn't want to try to finish the book because then I wouldn't have time to like do the, the final and I'm not a proponent of giving work over break. I think over break should be a break. Like turn your brain off, just enjoy your time, come back rejuvenated without a whole bunch of work. So we did a quick lesson. We've been reading a book called Persepolis. And for those of you that don't know, Persepolis is a graphic novel about a little girl named Marjane who's growing up during the Iranian Revolution. And we read this book for a number of reasons, and I won't go into all of it now, but part of it is I wanted with an all boys school to have a book where there's a female protagonist in it and to read something about a part of the world that my students don't know a lot about. Even though many of my students are Muslim and they, they know what their religion looks like in the US. And although I'm not trying to sort of necessarily shed light on any particular religion or, or teach lessons on any particular religion, it's just an underlying theme in the book. And so we have to explore it to some extent to really know what it means. And I know this is a tricky subject for some people, but it's the same way that we have to talk about the Bible at some extent when we read Lord of the Flies, like to understand who the Lord of the Flies is and who that, how that's supposed to signify Satan. Like we have to get into that stuff a little bit. Or in Merchant of Venice, we explore Judaism or in the Odyssey, we explore the world of Zeus and Hector and 
Hercules and all of that stuff as well. So to sort of connect this book to my students' lives, because they might think that what happened in Iran during this revolution was so far away, and it's to a little girl and her family, and how could they possibly relate? I found an article in Scholastic Magazine. And Scholastic makes this really easy. All you do is go onto their website, you type in something into their search bar, and a number of different articles or topics or blurbs will pop up. And so we read this article together called Islam in America, talking about what it's like to grow up in that culture, in that religion, in the United States in 2019. What's it like for young people to grow up in high school in America and want to be a part of the culture, want to have their clothes be cool or to be able to hang out with folks or to do things that other kids are doing, but also knowing that because of their religion, they don't want to put themselves in spaces where people are drinking or doing drugs. They're not allowed to wear revealing clothing. They're not allowed to date. And this was something that not just my Muslim students could relate to, but any of my students that were particularly religious. And even furthermore, students who just have parents that are attentive to those sorts of things that believe that that belief structure is important, that you shouldn't be dating at such a young age, or that you shouldn't be drinking or doing drugs. And so it became this conversation that everyone sort of could engage in. And then we could connect that back to the book. So it didn't seem like this far distant place. On the website also you can find questions that just really check for students' understanding. So there's up close questions. There's brief quizzes so kids can test their knowledge on different topics so that they, you're sure that they're not just reading it and saying they're done, but you're just checking to make sure that they read it or to make sure that they understood what they actually, what was important in the article. And then there's the organizing idea sheet that we used to sort of like make sure that you're not, that you're making sense of what's going on in there. So if certain students read things and then all that reading just kind of gets jumbled up in their head, it's a way for them to make sense, to map out what they read so they can clearly understand it and then do something with that understanding. So we worked on that in class, that took two days and then it set us up really nicely for break. And then we did something absurd because it was Friday and because I could feel the madness stirring up. Spring break creates, just like summer break, just like winter break, stir up a lot of feelings in students and oftentimes those feelings are tied into family members being incarcerated or no longer being around families separating like recently divorced parents or, or separated parents and all this stuff comes into play and then you are sort of like left dealing with that as a teacher so sometimes the best way to deal with that is to just minimize the distraction to sort of have a movie or a show or a quiet reading time or something that you're doing together so that you can touch base with the students that need to be touched base with, and also just kind of like go out on a nice note. So we watched Red Dawn, that movie with the guy that played Thor, because we were talking about what it would be like if your country got invaded. And honestly, that's the first thing I could think of was Red Dawn. I actually went to show the Patrick Swayze version, but I didn't know if anyone would like it. So I just showed the Thor version and that's it. But before you go, I have a quick ask of you. If you could, in the comment section below, I'm wondering what do you do right before break? So summer break's coming up. When you get to those last weeks and you're trying to review, but the review runs out or you run short on something to do, what are some strategies that you could share with others watching this video on ways that they could like extend the learning a little bit further or find some of those like one-off lessons that aren't throwaway lessons, but are something to spend time doing. That could be team building activities, that could be fun in the classroom, it could be something academic, but what are you doing in your classroom that is sort of filling that need that teachers feel at this time of the year? And that's it gang, thanks so much for watching. Peace.